So this episode is actually part two of our comprehensive uh, Heartland Film Festival 2015 uh, coverage um, two-part episode of the podcast. Uh, basically, what happened is we had tons of content between me having recorded with filmmakers throughout the festival and me and Tiny, my co-host, uh, sitting down and talking about it um, for about two hours. So I decided to cut this into two episodes. This is part two. Uh, part one can be found at obsessiveviewer.com at uh, obsessiveviewer.com slash OV136 or right before this episode in whatever podcatcher you use. It's OV136. Basically, in that episode, I ran down the best films that I saw at Heartland Film Festival as well as included um, a bunch of filmmaker interviews that I did on the spot at the festival. Um... Also, you can go to obsessiveviewer.com slash heartland2015. That's our homepage for everything Heartland 2015 related. That's all the reviews that I wrote, all of the podcast episodes, all the, all the related content to Heartland Film Festival can be found at obsessiveviewer.com slash heartland2015. So this episode is going to be about, going to be focused on me and Tiny talking about the rest of the festival, the rest of the movies that I saw um, during the week at Heartland Film Festival. So I'll let you get to it and enjoy it, and uh, thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah, so what were the, uh, some of the other stuff, you saw 25 movies, you just talked about 10 of them. Yes. Um <laughs> What were some of the other ones? Like, was there anything else that was noteworthy? Like, maybe not necessarily the best, but noteworthy. Right. Um, well, um, and it's funny. You said a, you said 25 movies. I saw, actually saw uh, 44 with shorts and everything. Yeah. So, but anyway, <laughs> um, again, I'm so single. Um, <laughs> so I'll break these down by... Uh, documentary i'll start with talking about documentary shorts um i have these all separate and i'll talk really briefly about about all of these but before i do that i have a recording um <laughs> with kurt nettleton who he he's listeners and and people will recognize him as the director of intruder who was at shocktober and irvington one yeah part of billy and brandon and snapshot productions group uh he directed um he he directed intruder and uh i saw him at the film festival and uh got to talk to him it was he yeah, so uh, here he is talking about his short film, uh, Your Catfish Friend, Philip Campbell, in which I completely forgot the name. Like, this was recorded the Sunday, Sunday night after the last screening, and I was like, yeah. So anyway, so here's the recording. All right, so I'm here with Kurt Nettleton, uh, the director of Your Catfish Friend, uh, Philip... Oh, wow. Crap. Philip Campbell. Philip That's Campbell. cool, man. Yeah. That's cool. That's like the subtitle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your Catfish Friend, uh, which is part of the uh, uh, shorts program, I think it's seven, uh, Art Appreciation here at Heartland Film Festival. We just cl- They just closed down the night and uh, with the screening of Coming Through the, lo- through the Rye. And, uh, of course, listeners will know that Kurt also directed Intruder, uh, which was screened at Shocktober Norvington 1, and he was the DP on Intruder 2. And the editor. And the editor, <laughs> uh, which screened at Shocktober Norvington uh, 2 uh, last week. So my first question is, why did you not come to Shocktober and Irvington? <laughs> I, was actually, I was actually here at Heartland. It's one of the few things I've made it to. I was working all this week, but I did happen to get off work in time to go to the Jazz Kitchen for the after party on the Friday, same Friday as, and that was sleepless. Let me tell you, I was editing... I was editing uh, Intruder 2 all the way up until, like, 9 a.m. that day, burning copies, like, to get ready for the night. So, that was a sleepless, yeah. I won't hold it against you. It's no big deal. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so why don't you tell us about about your catfish friend and how it uh, how it came to be and how it got into Heartland. Like, I, I was really excited to see it as part of... Uh, Heartland because I didn't get the chance to see it at Indie Film Fest, which it was, it was part of uh, one of the short films uh, blocks there as well, but I didn't get a chance to see it, so I was really glad to be able to catch it. So why don't you tell us a, a little bit about the short? Yeah, so um, like I do stuff with Billy and Brandon, obviously for Billy and Brandon Watch Movies, and then Intruder and, and Intruder 2, and hopefully when we get to that post short. Um, <clears throat> and then aside from that, um, my day job was always working at Cantaloupe TV, um, but 
I also, on top of doing both of those production-based things, always wanted to do some more stuff for my own. So last, um, the beginning of this year, in January, um, I got a freelance opportunity through a lady named Shate Marsh. Um, she was then the executive um, curator, I think is, would have been her title, for IMOCA, the Indianapolis Museum of Contemporary Art. And um, I had worked with her husband, who was the he's the founder of Big Car, the CEO, um, which is now my current job. I work at Big Car. I left Cantaloupe. Um, uh, she asked me to document this piece uh, done by Philip Campbell, and uh, I I'd, I'd known Philip Campbell, but I didn't really realize I'd known him. Um, and so she was like, it's the most money they'd ever spent on an artist um, to commission a piece. And it was this wall-sized woodcut carving. And so in part of spending that much money, she wanted to document it. And so she was like, let's make a film about it. So unfortunately, I was only there for the last like three weeks of the process. But um, for three weeks, well, I could sneak away on my lunch breaks at work, would run up and go film with Phil or in the evening go film with Phil. Stole some equipment from Cantaloupe to go film with Phil, <laughs> then brought it back and all that good stuff. So um, it was fun, though, and we were really happy with the way it turned out. And it originally was intended just to be a film in the gallery alongside the piece. So you would walk through Imoka, and as you went back, you see the wall-sized carving, and then you go into the next room, and it's this video about the work. So it's meant to be a 18-minute-long series of vignettes or stories about either how it's created or why it was created. Um, but yeah, that, that's the piece. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Um, I, like I noticed in, in the short that there was a, there was an emphasis of like kind of you, you, you shot it in a way that it was very close to the actual wood carving to kind of show the texture of it. I don't really have a question for anything like that, but what was your process in doing that, I guess? And also I really enjoyed that as a visual technique in order to tell the story. So there were, there were two reasons for that. One was, uh, I either had just gotten my macro filters for my camera, or my new lens, I mean, or I was going to buy them, and so I was using some macro filters that were cantaloupes. Um, but more importantly, the inspiration for this, I, I really enjoyed the idea that this is this huge. It's a massive wall-sized piece. And um, I thought, what a better contrast than to try to capture it one small frame at a time. So every a lot of stuff is shot either close up or with a macro filter to get even closer up to it. Um, and also along those lines, there is no, you'll notice, there's no final shot of the piece <laughs> in, the, in the film, which now as I watch it stand alone in a film festival maybe is a detriment, but... <laughs> I think the, I think it went. I think it. Uh, I think the finished product was great, and uh, I'm really excited that that it got in the Heartland and and Indie Film Fest. Or is it going anywhere else? Or what's next for you? Um, um, well, uh, actually, it's not going anywhere else. This is my first year applying to any film festivals, and so far, um, Intruder got denied from one out of the two. I haven't heard from the second one, which is weird. I need to ch- look into that. Um, and. Uh, and then your catfish friend got into both. I only applied to Indie Film Fest and to uh, Heartland, um, so I was pretty happy with that. Um, that's a pretty cool record. It's I didn't apply anywhere else. <laughs> um, but next year, next year I'm hopefully working on with Big Car this this longer actual feature length piece. So oh, awesome. we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I mean, like all the principal footage you'd call it is done um i want to do a big long round of interviewing we have some other stuff that's that it's got to be used for but then um jim and i have always talked about like um doing a really long cool piece and so we'll see it. it'll be my first venture stab into that <laughs> well best of luck to you and follow-up question for that which do you prefer or what's your process in doing a doing a documentary versus a narrative uh, thing? Which do you prefer doing? To be honest, I don't know. I, I there's pros and cons to both. Um, on the one hand, I don't really think of myself as a documentary person because uh, I, I feel like documentary people, although like really good ones, are made in the editing room. Um, for the most part, documentarians are. I feel like the personality is more about a shooter. Someone who likes to be out in the field collecting. Now, I'm really not that guy, and and I mean, for the last two and a half months, I've been shooting with Big Car um, while they did the occupancy on Monument Circle, and that's what we'll be working on. Um, and it was fun to get to kind of brush up on those skills again, but I'm excited to edit with it. Um, I would say 
for the, on the whole, I like narrative stuff a lot more. But I don't, you know, narrative stuff, you usually have to self-fund. I haven't quite cracked that code um, in right. how to do that. And neither has Billy or Brandon or Jared. <laughs> We'll keep working at it because I would love to see more more narrative and and documentary stuff from you guys. Um, and final question: What uh, was your favorite movie that you saw here? And uh, like, what all did you see? What's your favorite? And how did you feel about coming through the ride? Um, coming through the ride, really good film. Actually, it reminded me that I've never read Catcher in the Rye. To be really? honest, yeah. Although it was assigned, I've never read it. Um, and uh, I'm, I don't know. It was it was really well done. I have to say though, I think Romeo is bleeding. Hands down, I get why it's the grand prize winner. Like that, it it floored me. What it like, and that guy Dante is like an open book of like just. I don't know. He's just inspiring, man. That's, That's crazy. Awesome. I didn't get a chance to talk. Do you know if he left already? I, I think I feel like he's somewhere around here. Awesome. So I might need to. I might need to talk to him. I talked to his producer for the for the phone. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> He, yeah, that that documentary was really good. Um, yeah, did you did you happen to see Peace Officer? No, I, I actually I was um, since I got here so late, you know, working all week, and and we just finished filming Ted earlier this week. It was the last thing I had to do before I was done. Um, uh, um, I. I I, I was watching previews and I, I was making a list of all the films I want to watch. So keep in touch was on the list. Peace Officer, um, uh, the sci-fi shorts that I missed all of those because I love sci-fi. And uh, uh, there were a couple others I, I can't remember. Um, the one about the guy who's trying to break up with his girlfriend. Oh yeah, uh, Happy Times. There you go. Yeah, that's uh, on my list. <laughs> yeah, that was that was really good. It was it was really quirky, and uh, I got to chat with the, the director of that too. He he did a really a really cool technique where he he had he had the character uh, watching horror movies, uh, kind of to reflect the situation that he's in. But he didn't have the he didn't have, like he couldn't get the rights to like show like Halloween or anything, so he just reshot like some iconic scenes from like what yeah like like he's watching a screen and then there's this there's this reshot scene of, of the the the, the uh, iconic scene from the tracking shot at the beginning of Halloween where you're yeah. opening the door and getting the knife. I'm like wait a second. <laughs> it was it was awesome. He was a, he was a super cool guy. So that's yeah. super cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for chatting with me and uh and once i stop recording this we're going to be talking again so it's going to be uh, this is an awkward sign off but yeah so uh thanks and good luck with uh everything that you're working on and all that. thank you so yeah that was kurt nettleton uh yeah so so the rest of the shorts the, the the documentary shorts that i saw i'll talk really briefly about all of them and then we'll move on um okay so first up the art of richard thompson was really interesting it was about this cartoonist uh, uh this um Richard Thompson uh, draw, draws uh, like comic strips and stuff like in cartoons, but he's afflicted like he was forced to retire in 2012 uh, because of Parkinson's disease. Okay. But what's really interesting about this is it doesn't focus on his condition. It just it just showcases his art, and it's it's amazing. It's it's really it's really amazing. Um, so I really like that. And then Elgin Park uh, or Elgin Park, I don't know, but Elgin Park, I think, um, it's about this guy who makes miniatures and photographs them. And to kind of have this vintage, like, um, like he creates a world through these photographs of these little miniatures that look so like photorealistic and and amazing. It's it's really interesting. Um, he talks about his um, his uh, his uh, interest in it and 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 his um, motivation for it and stuff like that. And then uh, finding beauty in the rubble. All of these were in the art appreciation segment, by the way. Uh, Blocker shorts, but finding beauty in the rubble, I wasn't too keen on. It's about this woman who uh, creates necklaces from um, uh, debris she finds uh, in the in the ocean after the tsunami. Hmm. Um, interesting. It's interesting, but there wasn't enough focus on the actual art, and uh, it was kind of it was a little. I, I wasn't too into it. And then uh, next up was. N- uh, I'm going to butcher this. Nef- uh, Neferides. Neferides? I, Neferidi. Neferides. Uh, Daughters, uh, which is about street artists in uh, in Egypt during the Egy- uh, G- Egyptian Revolution. Nice. And uh, it was really long. I, I wasn't too crazy about that either because hmm. it, it kind of wasn't – it kind of lacked a certain focus. It wasn't – again, it wasn't really about the art. It, like it, it showed the street artists and it, it, they talked about it and everything. But then it eventually just shifted. It was like – I think it was like 40 minutes long too. Um, it shifted to um, – Talk about talk about you know uh, the women's rights in 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 Egypt and stuff like that, which is which is amazing and it's important and everything like that. But it just it got a little long and I kind of wish it was a little more 
I don't know, focused in it, I guess. I, I don't know. I wasn't too, I just wasn't too crazy about it. And then, uh, okay. your, and then, uh, your catfish friend, uh, Philip Campbell was directed by Kurt Nettleton, which you just heard about. So I won't really talk about that. I really enjoyed it. Like I said in the recording, I like the, the focus on the texture of it and stuff like that. Um, oh God. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, Growing Home was about uh, Syrian refugees uh, who were displaced and, and put into a, uh, a, a like a campground in, in Jordan. Um, really touching. Really showcased the uh, the um, not hopelessness, but the the homesickness um, mm. of it. Like like these people are just people that just want to be home in their home country, and they're they're in a like they form a little society in the camp. Like the it focuses on a barber trying to provide for his his family and and stuff like that. It's really touching it really showcases the homelessness of it um the nature of war uh was a short three minute thing where it was an animated thing uh animated short directed by the roch brothers who they had like a ton of shorts during th- scattered throughout but that's the only one i saw but it's hmm. basically this uh this uh, this guy from uh he was in the military he was stationed in iraq he's recounting a story of how uh he met two iraqi boys when he was in iraq and it's it's all it's it's just him talking and it's uh it's uh, there's animation playing showing it and everything it was very wow. very touching you can hear the emotion in his voice it's it's really interesting wow yeah um finally the the last story i won't, I won't or four <laughs> i won't talk that much about not a stranger was interesting it's a uh, the, the about this guy who did the stranger project which he was battling depression and he set a goal for himself to go talk to a stranger every day um, and and write about it and everything. So you can find more information of that at uh, just Google the Stranger Project. It's really interesting. Hmm. Um, then Open Your Eyes uh, was about um, uh, uh, people in Nepal um, who had cataracts and oh, okay. in the effort to um, to get them get them uh, get their vision corrected. It was it was interesting. A little long. A, a little. A little dry, I go. Not really dry, because the because the focus of the of it is this uh, this elderly couple who the, who the woman's very very spunky and mm-hmm. very entertaining. Um, then the hundred year shows about this um, this woman who is ninety nine and her artwork is just getting appreciated. Very interesting um, showcase of her art. It's geometrically like uh, based. Hmm. And then uh, Luchadora is a short about uh, women. Uh, uh, Lucha Libre, Lucha Libre, yeah, uh, fighters in in Mexico. It was interesting, but I, it, it wasn't really in my wheelhouse, and I, I don't think it really uh, it didn't really resonate with me. Hmm. Um, but documentary features, I'll talk about that. But first, here is a recording of me talking to Michael Klein, who's the producer of uh, of of the movie Romeo Is Bleeding, a, a feature length documentary that played at. Uh, Heartland, and was actually the grand prize winner for documentary features. All right, so I'm here with uh, Michael Klein, the producer of Romeo's Bleeding, uh, which just ro- won the grand prize documentary feature at Heartland Film Festival, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing documentary. Uh, also, it's just uh, it's it's incredible. So why don't you tell our audience uh, a little bit about the film and about and about the uh, what, what's it about and. Uh, uh, so the film is about a young poet from Richmond, California, which is in the Bay Area. And uh, the city of Richmond it has a turf war that's been going on for generations between North and Central Richmond. And our main character, Dante, uh, grew up amongst that conflict, uh, very deeply entrenched in it. And uh, the short answer to it is he was uh, introduced to spoken word poetry in high school, um, and that became an, a positive outlet for him. And taking his lived experiences, he wrote an autobiographical adaptation of Romeo and Juliet set in Richmond. Uh, so inside of Capulets and Montagues, it's North versus Central, um, and becomes spoken word poetry instead of Shakespearean sonnets. Um, and, yeah, it's a film about artist and environment and the power of one's own voice and self-expression. Nice, yeah, and it's it's a fantastic, fantastic film, as I said. And uh, something that struck me about it was just the way that it was filmed. Like, th- there's just these huge, wide shots of the city, and it's it just really is incredible at drawing you into into the story and, and the the environment of the of the city of Richmond. And it's just it's it's incredible, and I'm 
thrilled that it got that that it's getting such good recognition and it's and it uh, won the prize uh, here at Heartland. Um, is this your first time having anything at Heartland, or is this your first experience here? And uh, what do you think of it? Yeah, this is my first time at Heartland, and it is amazing. I've had other friends, filmmakers that have been here in the past and have raved about it, and they're like, "You gotta go, you gotta submit." And so when we got in, we were so excited, and it has not been a disappointment for sure. Great, great. And have you gotten a chance to watch any of the movies here or anything? Uh, and what's what's your favorite, Ben? Yeah, and that, I mean, that's the uh, amazing part of winning this award, especially, like, this honor. I got, I was lucky enough to see every single film that we were in competition with and to be amongst such amazing films and still get this honor is just amazing because they all were just such strong films. Uh, and so I'd say all the other docs in our competition are my favorite. Nice. Yeah. And uh, are there any plans for distribution or anything like that for, for Romeo's Bleeding? Where can will people be able to see it um, in the future? Yeah, the um, the that's still in the works, so the exact details aren't figured out. But uh, if people go to our website, romeosbleedingfilm.com, we're on Facebook, facebook.com slash risbyfilm, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, stay in touch, and we'll keep you posted on how best to see the film. Absolutely. Well, Michael, thank you, and, and congratulations again. Um, I'm sure that it, it's going to get just. I'm I'm hoping that people will see this and be able to um, appreciate the the story being told and all that. And it's I, I feel like it's going to be it's going to be big at, at some point in the future. So uh, congratulations again, and thank you for talking to me. Yeah. it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Uh, like I mentioned in the recording, he, it was really good. It was, it was. Uh, I really loved the way that it was filmed, and it's something that I didn't mention in in my talk with Michael Klein was that the way they reveal certain things, like uh, like the way that they reveal kind of the tension on the streets and the violence and everything, is really affecting. It's it's really powerful. Um, so it was really good. Uh, Dream Killer, did you see this in the guidebook by chance, Tony? Dream Killer, I yeah. may have. I don't recall it though. Okay, um. it's it's a documentary about this kid. Or this guy who gets uh, sent to prison for 40 years um, for uh -huh. a murder. But the whole impetus of it is that is that the murder happened in, uh, I think, 2001. And then two years later, the guy's friend told police that he had a memory of of uh, him and him and him and the guy who got convicted of it uh, murdering the guy. So, like, that's the that's the extent of evidence in the case. Hmm. And he still got convicted and sent to it. So, but I, I, I felt I had issue with with some of the uh, the way the documentary was handled. Like we didn't get in, like any, hardly any, if uh, barely any, if not any, <laughs> hardly any uh, context for the relationship between, the, like the friendship between them. It's, the whole movie is about um, the the guy's father trying to trying to free his son, and it's. Mm -hmm. It, I could appreciate the father son story of it, but I, I just thought that it wasn't handled that well. Like we don't, okay. we don't even have any. There's not even really any information about the about the actual crime or anything. Like mm -hmm. I know there's a a reporter, a sports reporter for a newspaper where it was where it was uh, where it happened, and that's it. Like that's the extent that they go into about the huh. actual uh, crime. That's a shame. Yeah. Um, the Big Lonely, which which uh, we covered earlier, uh, really interesting, um, really really interesting documentary about the. Basically, they gave. Did you see this? In the no, but I yeah. I was I really wanted to see this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it uh, yeah, it's really good. It's really good. Um, and then <laughs> Monty Python and the Meaning of Life, uh, <laughs> which is it, it was such a fun documentary, man. Yeah. It was awesome. It was uh, the first time. It was the first time the Pythons were on stage in 34 years. It was their last show. Wow. And uh, this happened last year. And it was basically just, it wasn't even like, it, what I loved about it was, it, is that it wasn't a, um, a documentary where it where it manufactured drama or anything like mm -hmm. that. It wasn't about like oh the struggle of getting these getting this up. It was like it was just showing a bunch of old friends riffing on each other and still <laughs> sharp as ever. Yeah, it was amazing. That sounds so cool. It was hilarious. Uh, the champions, which we all which we already talked about, um, and uh, finally the final documentary that I saw, uh, documentary feature was one that I think Tiny you would really appreciate. It's called Beyond Measure. Mm -hmm. Did you read about it at all? I don't remember. I can't. There were so many movies, and I looked through most of the synopses. I just I can't. I didn't yeah. come in all to memory. Yeah. So, so Beyond Measure is uh, 
it's it, it's a it's a it's about education reform basically it's oh, about okay. um alternative education tactics i guess so gotcha. about how kids are throwing away the curriculum in terms in favor of a of a uh, unorth- an unorthodox curriculum and stuff. Okay, and I, I saw a trailer for it before one of the other yeah. screenings, and it looks awesome. Yeah, it was really good. It was, nice. it was, it was really good. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I was really bummed because I couldn't stay for the Q and A because I had a screening right after it uh, to run over to. Um, plus, I really, really had to go to the bathroom during it. <laughs> That's the worst. Uh, it, it really is. That happened like twice. Um, but so I, I missed out on the Q and A, but it was a really interesting film and it was really, it kind of, it was, it, it was interesting because uh, like, uh, like I'm, I wasn't really that good with school or anything. And I always thought like, okay, well, school's just not for me and everything. But though the way that it presented, the way that it presented education to, to its audience and, and it wasn't like a, a, a huge indictment on, on the, uh, textbook based curriculum stuff or whatever, or the memorization and mm-hmm. standardized testing and everything, but it it touched on that quite a lot. But it just it kind of put my feelings towards school into into context, and it was really interesting. Nice. It was nice not to feel like I'm an idiot. <laughs> or not to think I'm an idiot. So we talked about documentary shorts. What about the uh, narrative shorts? What were some of your some of the other ones that were noteworthy? Well, tiny, <laughs> I'll tell you about it. Um, <laughs> But first, here's a here's a recording that I uh, of a of a of a, of a, a recording that I had with Michael Angelo Covino, who is the co-star and co-writer and producer for the movie Keep in Touch, which I'll talk which I'll talk about uh, here in a bit. But um, yeah, so I had a really nice chat with him, and here it is. Okay, so I'm here with Michael Covino from uh, Keep in Touch. He plays Brad, and he's also the co-writer. Yes, on it? yes, and producer. And uh, I just just. Why don't you just let us know, uh, tell us what, tell us about the film and, and what it's about and all that. Ooh, okay, here we go. Um, so the film is about a, uh, it's about a guy who looks up a childhood crush of his and uh, finds out that she died in a car accident years ago. And, um, you know, and in searching further, uh, he finds that she has a younger sister who's a musician in New York. And he starts going to her shows uh, just kind of out of curiosity and to reconnect and, uh, they end up they end up hooking up and and starting a relationship, but without him ever telling her who he is or what you know why, why he was even at her show in the first place. So it's um, it's sort of a relationship built up upon false pretenses, and it's uh, you know the repercussions of that. And but really, what the film's about is about a guy sort of uh, you know trying to restart his life and trying to find um, a new purpose in his life and kind of uh, struggling with you know connecting with sort of periods from his past when he was uh, li- uh you know happier times or seemingly happier times i guess right yeah, yeah. and that's that's something that kind of really spoke to me was that i mean he the actor that, that played the main character like he he really embodied that kind of listless and, and directionless kind of thing like you can kind of tell that he had an internal struggle there and it was really it really came through really well and yeah. uh it, it was there's a charm to his performance that when he's when he's like looking up looking up the girl and everything it's like it should be kind of like super creepy but it, it kind of comes across as an earnest like um uh push to, to find some kind of connection sure that really came through really well and uh so yeah so why don't you tell me like what, um uh what's next like if you're going to take it to other film festivals or uh or what's up next for uh keep in touch yeah well we're going to the, uh we'll be at the austin film festival in, like next week um uh, we'll find out about this film festival if we win the grand prize, which is pretty sweet because there's like actual money to be made, and so far it's just been uh, us sinking a lot of our own money into the movie and getting paid not not much. Uh, and then, uh, and then, so Austin Film Festival, we'll be at like the East Lansing Film Festival, the Kukaloras Film Festival, uh, the Charleston, South Carolina Film Festival, and then um, a couple more like in the future. But that's sort of I think that'll round out most of the big festivals we have coming up, and then. You know, figure out uh, finding a home for the film, and then finding a place for um, you know figuring out what the best way to release the film is, and how to get it out in front of people because that's the that's the main goal. And I know that it's, it's on the one of the festival award winners this uh, yeah. in this in this in this film festival, and it's you know it's well deserved too. It's, oh, it's a really good really good movie. And uh, also, I mentioned that you're 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 Brad in the movie. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. you're. You're an actor in the movie. Uh, why don't you tell me this? Like your background in acting is this? Is this something that uh, uh, like are you an actor first or a writer first or, or what's I, your? I think I'm a producer first. So um, I don't know. It's sort of like I think that's just by nature of like 
even if you want to be an actor, you can't really wait on anyone to cast you and things. So, um, so I don't know. Sam and I started a production company um, a little while back and had, did a bunch of commercials of branded content and corporate videos and anything anyone would hire us to shoot kind of thing. And, uh, and you know, eventually we said we, said we want to make a movie and... Um, and I had an idea, and then we started writing it together, and then we shot a short film that we then raised the money to shoot the feature and kind of built it all out of that. Um, that doesn't answer your question as to if I'm an actor or not. The answer to that is basically I act in a ton of stuff. I do a lot of sketch comedy and uh, improv sometimes, and, you know, just I, I, I love performing, and I love, like, improvising more, more than acting, but um, this role kind of lent itself to my, my strengths a little bit because I could be funny and kind of add humor to the film but not uh, but not have to carry the emotional weight of the film because I don't know that I ha- have the chops yet for that <laughs> well, you definitely brought a levity to it while also kind of really exploring the, the drama with, with the character by playing off the character thanks appreciate that thank you yeah, yeah cool yeah. Um, well yeah I won't take up more of your time or anything but thank you so much for chatting with me and all that and uh, where can people find uh, Keep In Touch online like, like- so uh, well, the, our website is keepintouchfilm.com um, our Facebook page is I guess forward slash Keep In Touch Film and um that is those are like the two spots where we do like Facebook is where we kind of give most of the information as to like where you can see the film what the next screening is all that stuff um, and then the website too obviously but um, yeah I would say sometime by mid to late November we'll have a better idea of what the release strategy is or who's going to be distributing the film and then we can kind of uh, you know better inform people as to when it's going to be coming out that's the, that's the hope cool awesome well uh, good luck on the future film festivals and on uh, tomorrow night's uh, work awesome. yeah thank you so much yeah, no appreciate problem. it All right, thanks again thanks man yeah. so narrative shorts tiny mm-hmm. um these these first three were from the sci-fi shorts uh block um much like the ones i mentioned earlier um against night was a russian a, about a russian cosmonaut who who crash it, crash lands in i think it's uh I think it's China or so, it's somewhere, but he has these hallucinations um, afterwards. And, and have you ever seen the original uh, Solaris from nineteen seventy two? No, I've not seen the original. Okay, it's 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 a really crazy, mind bending sci fi movie, but um, very slow too. But um, <laughs> but I mean, it's incredible. I loved it. Yeah. Uh, but this kind of echoed that a lot. It, it reminded me a lot of it, like aesthetically and in in terms of story and everything. Um, and I liked it. I, I liked it quite a bit. It was it was nice. Nice. Um, Dust, on the other hand, I wasn't too keen on. Um, it was about a uh, a world where um, there, there's a plague. It, it was kind of muddled. It was it was kind of it was an interesting story. It was an interesting mythology. But instead of having a story like a f- more focused story, like it seemed like all the dialogue kind of seemed to expand the uh, the mythology that of it. Uh, more and more and it was okay. it got kind of muddled but it looked it looked really good though <laughs> um and then movies in space was freaking hilarious <laughs> uh it's about a guy who gets sent to he's he's like the uh the earth ambassador to a new alien civilization that that <laughs> people have uh have um have come in contact with so he's there and uh, he gets uh basically the guy that he's that he's staying with is like hey let's watch a movie and like the movies uh, in the civilization are ch- <laughs> are just uh, flashes of light, <laughs> and, and the guy Travis is the is the Earth ambassador guy. He is based like he says like he he like says some offhand thing because he has no like he doesn't get why it's a big thing. Yeah, uh, he's like, oh, what if they did or uh, isn't that the same thing or whatever or. Oh, oh, it's like, uh, isn't it the same thing? And then they watch a couple more movies, and then the guy shows him his his film. He's like, "What if you? What if you?" Or like, he asks for tips, and he's like, "I don't know. What if you make it like yellow in that scene?" And then he becomes like a like he like that launches him to become like a a very powerful producer and studio executive <laughs> in that in that Hollywood thing. It's it's a brilliant satire of Hollywood. Oh my god! And it's it's freaking hilarious. That sounds it's, awesome. Yeah, it's called Movies in Space. Um, and then the other four uh, shorts. These next three were from uh, the this that or the other uh, block of shorts, which I didn't. I didn't really find a common theme with them or anything. But hmm. uh, okay, uh, born with it was about a Japanese, uh, a, a, a biracial Japanese kid who goes to school, and all the like Japanese kids 
think that he has AIDS because his skin, like, because his skin is he's he, his skin's black. Oh. it's really interesting because it's uh, it takes it takes a uh, it takes prejudice like something like something as horrendous as prejudice and and um, uh, race racism and stuff like that and puts it through through uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the filter of of naive children and, and the innocence of childhood is a really interesting hmm. uh really interesting short film um dakota was about a um a, a border a border control agent guy hmm. um who who <laughs> he he is investigating a a truck that's in the middle of like nowhere in the middle of the desert and uh he finds a, a kid who's smuggling in drugs into the country and it, they kind of have a little dialogue um it was really interesting it was it was uh the the filmmaker was there for a Q&A and uh he like the he said that he it was originally conceived as a feature and this was hmm. the, the it was filmed as a planning to make a feature of it so you can kind of tell that it wasn't like the full story but it was still good in its own right it had really good um like wide shots to to establish the complete isolation of where they were wow uh yeah it was really it, it was good um appendo which is i want to say swahili for love or something like that oh, okay. um is is about a kid who like uh has memories of his dad um hmm. who is dead telling him about love it's it's basically the kid like getting up for school or something and uh it's intercutting flashing with with flashbacks of his father talking to talking talking to him about love it's it's really interesting uh and really well shot like well well edited and everything because it it basically divulges the story uh through flashbacks intercutting with with the kid in present day it's it's really interesting to to um, say that it was um it stars a kid that's in empire now apparently um, oh, okay. Was it in Swahili? No, no. Oh, okay. It was filmed. I think it was filmed, or I think the filmmaker has ties to Indiana. He was there for a Q and A, uh, and he said that it was inspired by a. He, he wasn't dying, but he had a. He he was he didn't say what it was, but he said that he had some kind of medical condition that made him think of think in terms of of what message. Like if he dies, if he, like uh, um, what messages he would want to convey to his child and leave hmm. behind. So that that was the reason that he made the short, and it comes through really well. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it's called Upendo, and then finally the last narrative short uh, was called A Proud Woman. It was one of the festival awards shorts. It was. Um, it was interesting. It was about a woman who is the caretaker for an elderly woman who um, takes who who has a who has her daughter visit, and the daughter finds out finds out or, or realizes that uh the the caretaker is transgendered hmm. and so she threatens to she threatens to tell her mother and and have her have her fired and everything it's a really it's a it takes a it takes a present day issue obviously and um it's it's really uh, not uplifting it's it's really satisfying to see the way that it plays out mm-hmm and then that is the rest of the narrative shorts that i that i saw wow okay <laughs> yeah well, uh, these are kind of the big dogs for last, uh, the yes. narrative features, uh, which I'm really interested in a lot of these. So what were some of the other noteworthy narrative features that you saw? Well, Tiny, I will tell you that in just a second. <laughs> <laughs> You're having way too much fun. With I, I am because I'm mentally thinking in my head, like, should I, should we have done this this way? Oh, well. But, um... <laughs> This is a uh, this is a recording. I'm I'm going to get to my narrative, uh, the narrative features that I saw. But first, here's a recording with uh, Luis Javier. I'm 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 blanking on the last name, but uh, he directed, he wrote and directed uh, the last uh, the last film I saw on the last Saturday of it. Actually, <laughs> this one I had to I spent the day at Castleton and then I had to race over to uh, to Traders Point to see this one. Hmm. But it was called Happy Times. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about that briefly, but he in here in a bit. But um, here's my recording with uh, Luis Javier from Happy Times. I, I really enjoyed it. It's a it's a fun. It's such a fun. I, I think you put it as an anti rom com, uh, which uh, which was which was which was nice. It, like it was a that's that sums it up really well. Um, so can you tell me about 
about the process of making it and uh, and showing it at different uh, film festivals because this is the last stop for it, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, I, th- I think this is going to be the last stop. I mean, we have no more festivals, uh, you know, later this year. And I think the, the they kind of have like this thing that where you can't ha- have it, I mean, be older than 2014. So mm. I don't think we're going to make any other festival appearance. And um, yeah, well, it's been a hard road. I mean, a difficult, long road. We started out writing the screenplay in 2007. Wow. So from then till 2012, we were just looking for funding, and we, we, the the movie is government funded. So we have like in Mexico, we have like this kind of tax incentive where you can just submit your project and maybe get elected to kind of produce it, which is great because otherwise it would have been impossible to make a movie of that kind like with with no money at all so we have uh, we had like a small budget uh, for US standards maybe Mexico is kind of a pretty big budget and uh, that we filmed the, the the movie in 2012 and we finished it exactly one year ago <laughs> and we showed it at uh, you know Morelia International Film Festival and that was great it was our first screening and and since then we went to a few other festivals not many I always thought the film was more like of a commercial film more like of a broad comedy for people in Mexico would go see but that was not the case the case was that people actually enjoyed it more at festivals than at the you know the theaters and uh, we actually won a couple of awards one in Santa Barbara and um, and the other one in Washington DC, we won um, those two awards, and we went all the way to Dubai to present the film. So oh, wow. it's, yeah, it's been great. It was it's been great, and and you know this is as you said this is kind of the last uh, stop for the film I think, and we're looking into you know getting distribution here in the U.S. That was gonna be my next question. Any yeah, yeah. any luck with that, or is it still kind uh, of the well, up we're in still the yeah we're still yeah. looking. For you know, it's it's kind of difficult being in Mexico and getting noticed up here. I can we, we got a review, a pretty good review in Variety, and that kind of opened the doors a little bit, but still nothing close enough to right. having like a, a done deal or anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, the best of luck to with that and everything. Um, was it, is this your first time at Heartland? Yeah, uh, this is my first time at Heartland and my first time in Indianapolis. Oh well. wow! Yeah, yeah. Uh, how did you? How do you like it? Or how? Yeah, it's been, been great so far. I mean, the weather is kind of crazy, but <laughs> <laughs> that's in the end for yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I've been like, I, I was, you know, I stayed over in, you know, in Chicago in Chicago like mm. a couple of years ago, and but never, never to Indiana. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Uh, so what's uh, what's next for you uh, in terms of uh, filmmaking and all that? Well, we're currently writing our... I wrote this screenplay with uh, with another writer who's actually my girlfriend. And uh, she's a writer. I'm just a director. Okay. Ri- slash writer, co-writer. <laughs> and we're writing the next uh, feature film. It's another anti-rom-com, as you put it. And um, it's kind of a... It's not as complex as this one. Not as sophisticated, you know, per se. But um, I think... It's gonna have the same style and the same kind of uh, feeling to it. Cool, very cool. Uh, well, thanks for thanks for chatting with me. And uh, have you been able to check out any other any of the other films at Heartland? And if so, what's what's been your favorite? Uh, probably that one. Yeah. Well, actually, I think my I, I haven't seen much because the schedules. I mean, the right. the theaters are very uh, far from each other. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I I and what. The one I saw just now was uh, Raiders. Oh, I love that. Uh, yeah, I love that film. I think that was the best. I didn't. I I, I think I only saw three. Mm-hmm. And that was. The, I mean, it's so great. I remember when I was a young kid and I wanted to make films. So it's it really it's really inspiring, but at the same time, kind of depressing that yeah. they didn't pursue it since. Oh yeah. When they were young. There's that nice little like bit of poignancy to it yeah. that it's it's kind of it's you know it kind of pulls at you, but then. They offset it with so much comedy, just the way that they yeah. talk about talk about their adventures of, as kids, and then show the footage. It's just it's juxtaposed with that. It's just hilarious. But, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's kind of bittersweet, but I, I yeah. really liked it. Great. And, uh, I saw Embers. Oh yeah, what'd you think of that? I think it was very interesting. I, yeah. I liked it. I liked it. I mean, it's an interesting concept, and I think mm. it's very well made. And uh, yeah, 
<laughs> original. I thought it was original. Yeah, it's funny. It was a uh, part of it was filmed in a in a city like way like in the northern part of uh, Indi- Indiana, and uh, there was another film at Indie Film Fest that was also also shot in that city. So like I I just seen that film in uh, in July, and then I saw Embers the other day. I was like, wait, I just saw like that that exact area. It's because both were kind of post apocalyptic uh, movies. So what was the other one? Uh, it was called uh, Chrysalis. Um, oh, I saw a film. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I think yeah. so. It was pretty good. It was, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Uh, well, I won't take up any more of your time. Uh, congratulations on a, on a long festival run for, uh, for, for Happy Times, and uh, best of luck to, to your future projects and all that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad yeah. you liked the film, no and thanks for coming. Yeah, no problem. So, yeah, the, the movies that I saw, the, the feature-length narrative features that I saw, um, first up was The 33, which I mentioned was a uh, about the Chilean miners. I saw a press screening the day of Shocktober in Irvington. Um, you know, it was good. It was it was a fun like or not fun, but it was a it was a gripping like uplifting retelling or or, uh, or a feature uh, movie about the, about the Chilean miners, mm-hmm. which is which is a story that I didn't really follow on the news or anything. And one of the things I really appreciated about it was that it didn't um, it it didn't put an emphasis on like the news store news aspect of it it mm-hmm. was it was very much about the miners in in the mine the 33 miners that were trapped in the mine for 69 days um and it was also like it was the thing that i had asked patricia riggan was uh how she how she was able to handle the dual narrative um which the movie is kind of segmented between a story the storyline of the miners in the in the mine and then the above ground rescue efforts um, both the practical, the the practicality and bu- uh, bureaucratic nonsense that went into mm-hmm. to trying to get trying to get them rescued. Um, really strong performances. Uh, uh, Rodrigo Santoro is in it. Um, do you recognize that name? Tom? I do not. He was uh, Paolo of Nicky and Paolo fame on Lost. Wow. Yeah, and he's he's really good. He's 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 charming. He's the uh, minister of mining for Chile. And, uh, <laughs> but he has no experience with mining. Um, so it's, it's, it, it, and he's kind of cutting through the red tape and he's getting, he was getting them rescued and everything. So it was a, it was a really, it was a, it was a good uplifting movie. Um, uh, uh, Bob Gunton, is that his name? Um, the guy who played the warden in Shawshank Redemption. Mm-hmm. Okay. He plays the president of Chile. Really, which uh, is kind of interesting. I don't know if it's because I know him from other things that I, I kind of felt like he was out of place. I, like I'm not oh. one to really pick apart accents and stuff, but it was it was kind of weird to see him try to do a, a Chilean accent. Um, yeah, that's interesting. It was it was it was interesting, and it kind of took me out of it a little bit. But um, overall, it was overall it was pretty good. It was it was it was quite good. It opens wide in November 13th, and uh, Antonio Banderas was also in it, right? Yes, he plays like the. Uh, the kind of uh, um, uh, de facto leader of the of the oh, miners okay. in the mine, and uh, you know something that the movie kind of touched on is that um, also in the mine was uh, Lou Diamond Phillips. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. That's yeah, cool. he he plays kind of uh, one of the one of the engineers of, of the mine, hmm. and so there's a moment kind of early in their entrapment where uh, they're kind of butting heads over rationing food and stuff like that. And I kind of wish that it would have. Um, and I, I mean, sure, they're kind of hampered by, you know, it being a true story and, and following, mm-hmm. following what really happened. But I kind of wish that they would have explored more of like uh, like a, um, the the drama between those two and kind of like struggling for power because I thought that was a really strong dynamic. Hmm. I will also say before I move on to the next movie that there is a really – there's a really nice scene where uh, they're eating the last of their food and they're all around like their little makeshift table – and while they're eating their last food, like it shows just uh, them hallucinating, not hallucinating, but it's like their ideal, like last meal. Basically, it's a very oh, okay. touching, very very powerful sequence, and it was very spectacularly shot. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So next up is the truth about lies, which uh, it starred the guy who was uh, the stoner in the cabin in the woods. Okay. Yeah, and it's about a guy who is a pathological liar. <laughs> Basically, uh, and it's it's kind of funny. He he loses his job, his girlfriend, um, and his apartment all on the same day. His girlfriend is played by Mary, Mary Elizabeth uh, Ellis, yeah, okay. uh, the waitress from from Sunny, and uh, mm-hmm. it, and from there it's it's like he strikes up a friendship uh, with his like uh, it's hard to explain with his best friend's cousin who's married to a guy who he weaseled his way into a job at his company. 
um, mm. by pretending that he had a a big a big tech tech company that he sold. Okay, it's about his relationship or his his relationship with a girl, and it, you know it was it was just okay. Uh-huh. It was it was pretty funny. Um, but there was some segments of it like uh his there's a subplot involving his mom where the mom is just. I don't like she just did not do it for me like she was mm. really over the top and kind of a kind of a goofy character and didn't really fit well in the movie um and plus I couldn't really get behind the uh uh the 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 character is a very pathological liar like he's he lies all the time and I couldn't really get behind his story or get behind you know what he's um like why I should root for him basically because mm-hmm. he's lying his way around everything so but anyway, it was okay. Um, whew. Next up is Embers, mm-hmm. which is uh, it's a it's a sci-fi um, post-apocalyptic movie where basically the planet has been afflicted with a neurological plague that continuously wipes out the memories of everyone. Hmm. So it's a, it's it's literally it's basically like Memento on a global scale. Wow. Yeah, and it's about. It's it's really fascinating because it takes um, um, different perspectives. Like it shows it shows sev- several different uh, uh, um, uh, standalone storylines basically and mm-hmm. intertwines them. So there's like a couple who are who have these little ribbons to remind them that they that they are around each other and so that they clearly have some kind of connection. So that's how they stick together. And then there's this young this this young boy who's who's just mute and because he's he's. He's so young that he can't like he he loses all his memory of how to talk and stuff like that. Wow. Um I think that's I think that's the point they were coming across on. Or maybe he's just too young to talk, but anyway, so and then there's a there's a guy who is uh who's basically rage like he like his character name is Chaos basically in the in the wow. like no one says it, but in uh uh in in on IMDb his character's chaos because he's a very animalistic, very instinctual, uh violent person. Um and there's a bunch of other different characters. There's a there's a mother uh, a, a, a daughter and father character who are in isolation in this in this futuristic bunker. Um so it gives some variety. But what I really appreciate about the movie is uh that it kind of throughout throughout all of these different perspectives, they basically show it basically is a movie about what uh, human, what makes humans human, and it's mm. kind of like it's it's a really interesting kind of uh, uh, narrative device, having everyone constantly losing their memories and constantly reimagining or re- rediscovering things, and it's yeah. really interesting. Um, next up, and I'll be quick with some of these. Uh, the ambassador to burn was uh, you might actually be into the into this one, Tiny. Yeah, it sounded cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's only seventy six minutes, which I thought was interesting, but it's a dramatic retelling of an incident in Bern, Switzerland, where two Hungarian uh, uh, immigrants broke into the into the embassy and took the ambassador hostage. Mm. Um, it's a thriller. It's it's uh, it's. Yeah. <sighs> The best thing I'll say about it is that it, it looked just incredible. Like mm-hmm. it, it pictured the or it uh, it showcased this drab '50s aesthetic because it was in 1958, mm-hmm. um, and it's it looked just really beautiful. Um, and actually, the the Facebook page for it uh, took a quote from my review, which wasn't terribly favorable. Like the review was not my most favor- favorable of the film festival, but they uh-huh. took a review uh, and took a took a quote from it and posted it to their Facebook page. So I thought that was cool and tagged us yeah. on it. So that was cool. I thought that. Yeah. So the ambassador burn. Um, and then superior was one. Did you see the description for this one? I saw this. I wanted to see this one. I was going to try mm-hmm. to squeeze it in, but I didn't get to. Yeah. I was really looking forward to this one too. It mm-hmm. was uh it's a, it's a movie about in 1969, two, two best friends uh, embark on a, an adventure to uh, ride their bikes um, uh, 1300 miles around Lake Superior Wow! in 19 in summer of 1969 before they go their separate ways as one of them is going to college and the other is going to enlist in the military and uh, go off to Vietnam. Um, it was good. I, it was good for the most part. Um, mm-hmm. I, I kind of, I really wish I could have stuck around for the Q and a cause the filmmakers were there and the filmmakers are really young too. Um, I think hmm. they're like 25. Wow. Um, yeah. And I actually met the mother there when going in. Um, I thought it was okay, but it kind of se- seemed a little, uh, a little in- inconsistent tonally. 
Okay. Um, like, like you don't really get a sense for you don't really get a sense of of why this trip is really important to them or why it, why it had been important in their planning as children to to do it. Um, you only get for context. You only get. You only get it as a distra- as it being a distraction for them from their future, and it, I don't know. And then, um, yeah, it was it, some of the uh, whenever whenever the character Derek, who's going to go into the military, whenever he makes comments about how he doesn't want to die in Vietnam, it's kind of it's kind of undercut by this this weird humor that he infuses into it, which makes it a little. It, it was charming at first, but it it also kind of kind of delayed the drama a bit too much for me. Mm-hmm. Um and then also the movie didn't really didn't really tell me exactly why like, like it didn't set it up it didn't set it set up his impending recruitment as the most um as as his only option basically. Like okay. like it kind of like there's a scene where the other kid is saying um Saying like, well, you can get a job, you can go to school and stuff like that, and I don't remember if he gave a valid reason because uh, the guy, the guy is under pressure from his father, but it's also like he, he did, you didn't, you don't see him trying to find a new job or trying to find a job so that he doesn't go that. You just show it, you just see him not, you just see him accepting that he's gonna go into the military, and it didn't really feel, feel that, uh, uh, that. Uh, strong for me in in the setup. So, hmm. but uh, for the most part, it was it was pretty okay. It was pretty it was pretty good. Um, okay. In the end. So, uh, next up is Keep in Touch, which uh, you should have already heard me talk about with Michael Angelo Covino, uh, who actually was at the after party for for the closing night movie, and I talked to him for a bit there too. Which he was, he's a super nice guy. Um, Keep in Touch. I liked it. Um, I didn't like it quite as much as I thought I would going into it. Did you read the synopsis for this? I don't recall. Okay, so it's about, and you guys have already heard this, but uh, it's about a guy who um, tracks down, basically stalks <laughs> the sister of a girl he had a crush on as a child. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. I heard of this one. Yeah, yeah so uh, the performances are great. Like the, it's, it's amazing because... Um, the dude, the guy is doing really creepy things, like stalking this girl, yeah. like like legitimately stalking this girl. But um, he has such an earnestness to it, and the the movie is so focused on him in in shambles, like his life is in shambles after an incident that sent him to prison. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get you get him doing this stalker stalker behavior, creepy behavior, but you you get a connection to why he's like why he's clinging to this ideal. Uh, so strongly it was it was overall it was it was actually really good and the girl that plays the uh the sister um her name is gabby gabby uh mcphee who they found on facebook um <laughs> wow. uh, who she's an aspiring musician and she actually wrote music for the movie um specifically for the movie uh she's unbelievably charming in it like she and she's gorgeous too like i like one of my notes was like i think i love her <laughs> like she's she's amazing and she's great in it so hopefully hopefully everyone involved with that gets you know a good boost cuz cuz they they were all really good nice um okay so next up is uh, three windows and a hanging which uh is actually from Kosovo um it's Man, it was it was really it was really powerful. Yeah. Um yeah, it was uh it was about a woman who tells a reporter, a woman from a village in in Kosovo, um who tells a reporter that she was raped during during uh the 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 war, recent war there, I guess. Um mm-hmm. I'm not too uh, uh, the ethnic conflict there. Yeah, a, a year after the war in 2000. Okay. Um. So she so she says she was raped there, and three other women in the village were also raped, but she doesn't say who they were. Okay. So from there, the the whole movie is about this very uh very patriarchal, is that the word I'm looking for, <laughs> uh society, mm-hmm. and, and how it, it's it's really like one one of the central characters is the the president of the village, and and he's kind of the figurehead of it. And he's so so terrible, like he's despicable, and it, it's a reflection of the entire commu- the entire village feels like that she's shamed herself. It, it's like it's uh it's basically shaming her for being a rape victim, and uh, it's it's so it's so tragic because mm-hmm. 
everyone's like like she's completely ostracized from the community. She lost her husband in the war. He hasn't like like she he was missing. So it's just her raising her son. She's a, a school teacher, and uh, it just shows shows how the entire community turns against her for revealing that she was raped. Basically, wow. it's it's very jarring, very very tragic, and very sad. It's it's uh, yeah, and it was. The the director was there and uh and had a Q and A afterwards. So after after the Q and A, he said that he uh I can't remember the question, but I I think someone asked him how he liked Heartland or whatever. He said like it's it's great and all that. And uh, he said that he said that I promise next time I'll come here with a with a comedy. <laughs> it's a very it's a very dark and and very right. sad movie. All right. Um and then Waffle Street was so much fun. Uh I wanted to see this one too. It was it was so awesome. And it and somehow it makes it even better that the that the filmmakers were so cool. Like everyone that I talked to was incredibly cool. Uh but Waffle Street guys that like Ian and Esham Nelms were just really friendly. But Waffle Street's about a guy who uh you heard in the recording. He uh he goes into the food industry after losing his fi- uh, finance job. Um really good, really strong performances too from uh James Lafferty from uh One Tree Hill and uh, uh Danny Glover actually also. Nice. Um it really showcased the the hell of the food service industry from what I can tell. <laughs> but it did it in a way that like I what I loved about it was that he uh the character is cocky at first because he's he's like oh he takes to the register really well because he worked in finance and all that and then mm-hmm. like once the dinner rush happens like he's completely completely out of his element completely <laughs> like he gets lower down like four pegs, um, so it was it was really good I really I really enjoyed it um, yeah and then next up is Happy Times, uh, second to last one guys promises is almost <laughs> over, um, so Happy Times was. Uh, a movie in, like we said before, an anti rom com where he it's a it's a Mexican film about this guy who tries to break up with his girlfriend, and then hires a service to do it for him. <laughs> um, it was okay. It was it was it was pretty charming. It was a fun like quirky, quirky comedy. Um, yeah, it was it was fun. It was fun. Um, nice. And yeah, that sounds like an Adam Sandler movie. He starts a breakup service. I mean, <laughs> it kind of does. I would give it so much more credit than that, though. Nice. Okay. Um, it was it was more fun, more fun than that. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, finally, guys, we're, we've come to the end. Nice. <laughs> okay, so the last movie of Heartland Film Festival 2015, the closing night movie, was Coming Through the Rye. Which, before I talk about it, I I was actually really uh really happy because uh Greg the uh the uh marketing director for Heartland um who like I talked to him intermittently throughout the throughout the uh film festival and he's a super nice guy um after we did the red carpet thing which we'll talk about after I give my thoughts on coming through the rye uh he was like hey do you want a ticket uh I know it's sold out but I think we have a few extra ones and for context my press pass got me access to every movie except for the special presentations which include opening night closing night films and a few special presentations throughout the throughout the event um or throughout the festival and coming through the rye of course being the closing night movie was one that it didn't give me access to so it's a 30 dollar ticket if i used a uh, the we had a promo code for press that gave us half off so it was like a 15 dollar ticket that you just gave me for free so i thought that was really nice nice um yeah so it's basically this guy James Sadwith. He's a writer and director of it. He, um, when he was a kid, he was obsessed with The Catcher in the Rye um, and wanted to adapt it into a play. And so when he was uh, in uh, a prep school, uh, he went in search of J.D. Salinger, hmm. uh, who it, who was obviously very famously a recluse. Um, so coming through the Rye is is an a version of, of what he did. Um, it's okay. about a kid named Jamie played by Alex Wolf, who's the brother of Nat Wolf. Um, uh, he, he goes on to search for, uh, JD Salinger and it's, it's really, it's a really interesting, uh, drama. Um, uh, it, it, it was really good. I really, I really liked it. Um, uh, it was an interesting hybrid of like a of a, of a road movie and and about his first love with uh, with the with the female lead uh, uh, Stefania Owens who played uh, Dee Dee. They had really strong chemistry and it was it was really it was really it was really good. It was it was really good. I liked it a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Did you see anything about that? Or I didn't. I don't remember okay. reading about this one. Yeah, it was on a separate page of the of the guidebook, but it was really good. Have you read The Catcher in the Rye? I did when I was in junior high. Okay. Yeah. I read it like six or seven years ago. I thought it was mm-hmm. vastly overrated. Really? Yeah. I you know after seeing Coming Through the Rye, I really I want to read it again because I yeah. haven't, I haven't read it since. What year did we have health with Miss Harrison? Was that sophomore year? Maybe I'm thinking of something else. Was it sophomore year? Yeah, I did read it sophomore, sophomore year. Sophomore year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, I read it sophomore year, and which was over ten years ago. So I need to read yeah. it again with a fresh eye. But um, true. Yeah. Uh, so coming through the rye was was really good. Okay, and so in that uh, that closing night event, they they had a, a special screening and like a recording for. Um, press and stuff like that and you got to go to that yeah it was it was really interesting because throughout heartland they uh they set up like they like they emailed like they emailed me as part of the press that had the press passes and stuff they emailed me about a um a recording or a press opportunity with patricia Reagan, which i talked about earlier uh which was really cool and then they also had a uh an interview opportunity with the filmmakers and stars of coming through the rye it was a red carpet thing um, so basically what they did at, at Trader's Point, they set up this, this the backdrop of Heartland um, in, in one of the hallways, and they had a little red carpet, and they had uh, the writer-director James Sadwith, uh, producer Sarah Elizabeth Timmons, uh, actress Stefania Owens, and actor Alex Wolf uh, kind of come through and talk to, talk to the members of the press that were there. Uh, it was me and I think five or six other people. Um, that's a really cool idea yeah it was awesome it was like huh. it was like it, it was like a big it was similar to like like big a big event like like right. uh, like a uh, like the oscars kind of thing or something like right. that, like a big premiere um but just kind of a nice like kind of intimate kind of small scale kind of thing okay um so it was, it was pretty cool like there, there was a guy the guy next to me was from uh film buzz tv in utah okay. um who I chatted with him. It was it was pretty cool. And uh, and the other guy next to me was a, I think he said he was a senior at IUPUI. He uh, wrote for the uh, IUPUI newspaper. I think the Jag. No, no, no. no. Um, That's not what it's called. I don't know if uh, I don't know if that it wasn't that publication. Oh, okay. If that if that was what it, it was something something else. But he what, he was at IUPUI. Gotcha. Uh, and he's graduating with a uh, uh, for journalism. And it was funny because I I. I made the remark that like, <laughs> like, <laughs> cool, you know, you're you're looking for you're about to enter the workforce for journalism, and I'm doing this for free on my own. I'm destroying your job market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know, I don't know if he appreciated that. But That's funny. I said it in jest, but anyway. <laughs> so that that whole experience was really was really fun. It was really cool. And here is the recording of the red carpet. Um, the red carpet event with, uh, in order of where you'll, of what you'll, uh, in order that you'll hear them in, it's writer, director, producer, James Sadwith, uh, producer, Sarah Elizabeth Timmons, actress, Stefania Owens, and actor, Alex Wolf. Hi, James. My name is Matt from Obsessive Viewer. Yes, um, so you have an, you put an emphasis on, on uh, uh, you were determined to cast teenagers in this, in this film. I, for one, appreciate that because you never see teenagers actually portraying teenagers on right. film. Um, I was wondering, could you speak to the experience of, of casting and, and directing uh, teenagers in such a such a focused story that, that is so important to you personally? Well, yeah. And one of the funny things was um, some of the things like, You'll see in the movie, um, his brother pulls out a bra, uh, with my and that was a big deal in 1967 when that happened. It was like, where'd you get that? And now it's you to hold it up. These guys are seeing everything on the internet and on movies and TV. And then, so I had to explain to them, um, you know, you have, this is like something. Anyway, that was that was interesting. But I, I love the energy that they brought to it, um, and there was a real innocence and. Um, uh, they're real teenagers, both 16 years old, and it was tough. I mean, we had a lot of people. We had to have people who were in their early 20s come in and stuff like that, but um, well, to be, we lucked out, and we got real kids. 
Nice. That's that's fantastic. Like I said, you never you never really see that. Usually they cast older. Right, I know. Uh, you watch yeah. high school movies and these people are in their twenties and Exactly. It, it makes me feel a little bit better about getting older, but you know, it's they're not kidding anyone. But um, so in adapting such a such a personal story from, from your from your youth and everything, do you have any um, was there any trouble getting into screen or fitting it into into a, a feature length narrative? Or did you have to make any cuts or, or is there anything in the film that you didn't want to or that you couldn't weren't able to uh, include for time constraints or anything like that? Well that was one thing that was kind of liberating on the one hand because in TV you're always cutting for whatever the hour allotment is at that particular decade you know it was it used to be an hour it used to be like 52 minutes and then it was 50 minutes and then it was, now it's 45 I think but um, so I felt like I was going to be liberated there so basically I just yeah. cut for pacing um, and I mean I like things to to unfold slowly and take their time and I got I was told by some people <laughs> that you know what you need to tighten it up a little and um, so that's been the battle is being able to cut the things that are precious to you very cool I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it uh, it sounds just right on my alley and um, in terms of the uh, the story of, of you know seeking out uh, JD Salinger and everything um, this this actually happened to you and everything I obviously don't want to spoil the movie or anything but it was there anything um, in, in telling the story that uh, uh uh, of JD, or, or what's your history with JD Salinger, and how did you come about uh, uh, reading Catcher in the Rye as a, as a kid and everything? Your history with it. So I read the book in school as a tenth grader, and uh, decided that uh, I wanted to play Holden Caulfield in the movies and in the theater. And so I took it upon myself to adapt it as a stage play to put on at school. And you'll see all this; it's uh, all in the movie. And um, then I felt this need to go find JD Salinger. I think. You know, at the time, I said I, wa I wasn't really asking his permission because I was afraid he might say no. <laughs> so I was going to sort of get his blessing, and I just felt that he recognized me. That's actually a line in the movie that he actually say, oh, this is the kid to be holding Caulfield. And it uh, didn't quite happen that way, but um, that's the, that was the connection. Well, you got to tell your story, and I'm really excited for it. And uh, best of luck, to, to and congratulations on all your success with it and everything. Thanks very much, Matt. Hello again. Hello. Hi, I'm Matt from ObsessiveViewer.com. Oh, nice uh, to meet you. I'm yeah. Stefania. Nice to meet you. Um, so, so I was wondering what um, drew you to the to the story, and, and what kind of uh, what, what were some of the challenges of, of filming filming the filming the movie? Um, well, I am from New Zealand, so um, I just got this script from my agents who sent it to me, and um, I put myself on tape not actually reading the full script, but um, when I knew that Jim was interested, I read the full script, and I think it's it's such a real story, and the relationships between Jamie and the other characters are um, really realistic and raw, and I think that um, it tells a great first love and a journey and um so I think that was that was something that I really loved about it because it was so realistic and I could really relate to the teenage characters. Um, and a challenge... <sighs> what's a challenge that I faced? I actually... <laughs> it was... Jim made it really easy for us all. Like, when we got to Virginia, we had rehearsals and Alex um, and I had so much fun and we made it really casual and it wasn't, like... It wasn't, it, it wasn't hard at all. It was... I, I guess... Yes, um, there's a lot of like emotional scenes in it, so it was definitely a challenge getting you know to those emotional scenes. But as a whole, it was just so fun and easygoing. Great, that's fantastic. And uh, and also, I would be remiss if I didn't if I didn't ask you about this, but um, I'm really looking forward to to Krampus. And uh, oh. just if, if you want to say just something about uh, about that, uh, if, if, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm so happy. Um, yeah, Krampus is coming out the last week of November, and I'm so excited. It's um, it's something different because it starts off as like a family comedy Christmas movie, and then Krampus comes to town and starts picking people off one by one. So it's definitely going to be something different, and I'm really excited that it's um, being released during Christmas time. So hopefully um, it picks up and it does well, but I'm really excited for it. Nice. Well, congratulations on 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 this and and all your all your success and everything like Thank that. I'm sure you. it's going to be. 
be great. And uh, yeah, it was a pleasure chatting with you. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That's Hi. Hi. I'm Matt um, from ObsessiveViewer.com. And uh, so, so your production company, I was wondering if I could ask you about that. Um, it, it focuses on strong female characters and, and projects like that. What, what drew you to this project? And uh, and yeah. Well, it's it's a true story. Um, I think that you've got very inspiring characters based on Jim's journey. And I think that there's a line in the movie where um, J.D. Salinger says to Jamie, who is the director, you know, space the director, he says, Jim, you're a smart boy, go do something of your own. And I think that there's a lot in that line that, you know, so often we define ourselves by trying to follow what other people are doing. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's really looking within yourself and seeing what your greatest strengths are and um, how you can take your strengths and really inspire others and go create something on your own, no matter how scary it is. And you know, that kind of is the essence of, you know, Life Out Loud Films, which is, you know, inspiring people through the stories. You want people to leave the theater, you know, wanting to follow their dreams or reunite with a relative or somebody they might be estranged from. I mean, it's about it's about making more than just a film. It's about making a difference and hopefully inspiring people. And I think that that's exactly what this film does. And it's even more inspiring that it's based on somebody's true story. Yeah, that's one of the most appealing things about it for, for me personally because I, I love any kind of any kind of story like that and inspiring. And it seems perfectly in, in keeping with the theme of Heartland Film Festival itself. Um, have you have you had any um, uh, uh, history with Heartland or anything like? That? I do. We were. Um very honored in 2013 was my first time here with one of our other films called Wish You Well, which is based on a David Baldacci novel, and had a great time. And it's an honor to be back here as closing night film. Great. Well, uh, thank you, and and congratulations on on, on the film, and uh, best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Alex. My name is Matt with uh, ObsessiveViewer.com. Hi. How you doing? Pretty good. How are you? I'm good. Good. I just got here. I'm a little tired, but yeah, I'm good. <laughs> right. Well, congratulations on the film and. And I'm really excited to see it. I was wondering, did you have, any, did you feel any pressure um, um, tackling the role, tackling tackling a role that is based on the, the uh, writer and director? Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah, <laughs> I felt tons of pressure the whole time, actually. But but it was also totally a lot of fun. And, and Jim made it really clear uh, early on that he didn't want me to do like a full on imitation of him. You know, he wanted me to sort of take my own thing and bring it to it and sort of and I, and that's sort of what I did. I did it. You know, there's all that element of this sibling gone, this uh, this you know dead brother, and there and that's so painful and it hurts so much. And and I have a brother, and so I I feel like that uh, that informed a lot of the character about a, a, a kid dealing with the loss of his brother. That just really killed me. And and Catcher in the Rye is like my favorite book in the whole world. It has been since I was 12. And I just said in a you know a bunch of other interviews, my my grandpa read it signed it passed it down to my dad he signed it passed it down to my brother he signed it and then he passed it to me and signed it when everyone was 12 and um it just changed my life and it changed all of our life it's a family tradition and so i really did i mean i was obsessed with that i went home and i would read at least 30 pages a night i read the book probably total like four times throughout the movie because i would read it and then i'd start over and read it again and i just read it and and, and but the hardest part was differentiating holden and jamie and that was a big big turning point so I had to do that but playing Jim I I looked at a few pictures of him when he was young and and imitated a lot of his clothing that was the main thing I got a lot of his clothing and his hair and I was trying to do that specifically yeah very cool well thank you and uh, and and yeah uh, have you ever been to Heartland or anything like that I've I've never been to Heartland I've heard of it it's you know it's a big fun festival but yeah I've never I've never been it was my first time I've been to Indianapolis a few times though yeah yeah nice well thank you for your time and uh, congratulations on the film and and, uh, Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward What's to seeing What's your name? What's your name? Matt. Matt, yeah, nice to meet you, Matt. Nice, obsessive viewer. Yeah. You're an obsessive viewer. Uh, yeah. I like it. <laughs> okay, so I had a few anecdotes uh, on about that. Um, when talking to Stefania Owen, I may have, I think, I didn't actually spit on her, but I almost accidentally did. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, as you heard, my God, I jumbled a question to, to the director so hard. It's, it's pretty bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also I was kind of one thing that I really appreciated about Heartland was that they gave us a press packet with, with information about the movie and the actors and everything. So, um, 
before I had that, like I was trying to think of what to ask Alex Wolf because I didn't, I hadn't read up on the on the movie yet. So like <laughs> one thing I I toyed with asking was like, okay, so your brother is Nat Wolf, who works, uh, who has a strong working relationship with Josh Boone, who <laughs> is uh, currently working on X Men New Mutants, uh, <laughs> which is a franchise in which Jennifer Lawrence has appeared. So can you please tell your brother to tell Josh Boone to tell Jennifer Lawrence that I love her? Um, <laughs> Jeez. But yeah, that didn't happen. Good. Um, yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. So we're closing this out, Tiny. This is this is such a long episode. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was a huge event. So. It was. It was. Yeah. So do you want to intro this uh, this this last one? Yeah. So this last part are. The ones we wish we could have seen. Um, Matt said 140 some movies in 10 days. Yeah, it's impossible to see all of them. It's right. just impossible, and so yeah. of course I, some are going to slip through the cracks. Right, like and like while while thinking about this or, or trying to come up with it or uh, or looking through the looking through the schedule and everything, I was I might edit this out. Um, <laughs> Do you remember the line in Schindler's List where he says, I could have saved more or something? Yeah. I basically thought, like, I could have seen more. <laughs> so basically, I'm the Oscar Schindler of Heartland Film Festival. Pretty much, yeah. I might cut that out. Uh, no comment. <laughs> um, well, uh, at the top of my list, the ones that I really wish I could have seen was Raiders, uh, the mm-hmm. story of the greatest fan film ever made. That just sounded so fun to me. I'm really bummed that I missed that one. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, Fourth Man Out sounded like such a great idea for a movie. Um, it sounded funny. It sounded awkward and, <laughs> and and touching at the same time. I really wish I could have seen that one. Um, Keep in Touch, which I you mentioned earlier, um, that just sounded like creepy and, and like <laughs> and like such a such a um, such a unique situation to put yourself in mm-hmm. um I, I i would have enjoyed seeing someone explore that um the 33 just because i mean it had it has a cool cast and it was kind of one of the the special movies they got for this and mm-hmm. um it's going to have a wide release uh, it's got a lot of buzz around it so i wish i could have seen that one um and then lastly because i'm a big documentary dork <laughs> um peace officer sounded really really cool to me i wanted to be a cop for a long time i have a degree in criminal justice Mm. um so i think it probably would have meant a lot to me i hope it finds finds distribution somehow Mm -hmm. and i can see it eventually so those were the the big ones i wanted to see yeah i i I would be really interested to hear what you think of peace officer and also beyond measure too because i know that you originally went to college for education true yeah well (laughs) everyone goes to college for education hey but anyway as a major anyway um so yeah, cool. Uh, should I go with my list? Please do. Okay, so this is an extensive list. Uh, really briefly, uh, I wish I could have seen the opening night movie of Room, but, you know, Shocktober, mm-hmm. um, which I'll see it eventually when it comes out. Uh, I heard a lot of people talk about this documentary called Crocodile uh, Gennady, Gennady uh, which is, uh, I don't know what it, what exactly it's about, but all I know is that it's, uh, it's Russian, and the image in the guidebook looked really really interesting like it was uh this guy with a like a like orange light is on him and it's like smoke all around him it kind of reminded me of uh, uh i don't know if this is intentional or not but it kind of reminded me of uh of a like a, a shot of um um marlon brando in apocalypse now kind of just the way it's lit it reminded me of that just very vaguely but um interesting yeah, I also wish I could have seen the the judgment, which was the one of the grand prize winners. I think it was the grand prize narrative feature winner uh, of Heartland Film Festival. Um, it looked interesting. Um, also, the armor of light sounded interesting, but now that I said it, I don't remember what exactly it was. <laughs> but it looked, it, it sounded really interesting. Um, I'm really bummed I didn't get to see Autism and Love. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a documentary about. Um, People with autism find like how they how they handle relationships and stuff, and it right. sounded just absolutely fascinating. But unfortunately, I I couldn't find a, a time to see it um, with my schedule. Um, and then Oddball was it sounded interesting. It's about a um, a, a, a dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a family movie. It and I saw the preview for it, and it looked really really fun. But it looked like super family friendly kind of kind of fun i i don't know the more i saw the trailer the more i kind of thought like eh, that could be kind of fun um very semi-serious is a documentary about uh 
the uh, I think the cartoonists at the New Yorker. Oh, okay. Uh, sounded really interesting. Nice. Um, and then there were a few shorts programs that I didn't get to see. Um, most notably, the one called uh, "All You Need Is Love," which had a lot of uh, relationship-based uh, short films in it. That all of them sounded really interesting. Like one is about, like all the premise said for one was a couple, a couple, a couple visiting New York try to find a place to eat, and it sounds like that mm. that kind of setting and that that kind of like that log line sounds really ripe for uh, some kind of deep. Um, uh, Deconstruction of of certain relationship aspects. I have no context for what it is, but right. it sounds like it sounds like a like a um, a deep well to go from. I guess I don't know. Or a good uh, backdrop for that. So so yeah. yeah. And then uh, finally, they had a high school film competition uh, oh, shorts. Yeah. yeah, it was a collection of short films from high school high schoolers, and I wish I could have seen that too, um, but I didn't. So yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that does it for our. <laughs> Very extensive um, Heartland Film Festival 2015 um, podcast episode. Again, I want to thank everyone at Heartland for uh, being super cool, having a uh, having a great a great selection of movies and stuff like that. Particularly um, Sarah and Greg from like they they were part of the marketing team. They were I talked to them uh, consistently throughout it, and they. Uh, didn't seem bored by me, so that was cool. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, so, yeah, any parting thoughts on Heartland? Uh, I really hope next year I can do more. Um, yes. Hopefully my company won't buy another company that week. <laughs> so, right, right. Um, hopefully your company doesn't grow. Yeah, hopefully it doesn't. Or, yeah. <laughs> I'll be fired tomorrow. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, I, I really want to do more next year, uh, even if I don't get a press pass, because what little of what little of the festival I was exposed to I really, really enjoyed, and I want to see more of it. <laughs> oh tiny this this is not going to be the last time we get press passes or something <laughs> yeah i think <laughs> like so. i was too way too like i was really i was really satisfied with that and i i'm yeah and it was funny because after indie film fest in july i was like um i need to do more things like this and more things like this and i didn't think like i'd emailed them about a press pass but i didn't get a response from them because it was like two weeks before it mm-hmm. um and then i just dm'd hardland about a press pass just on a whim so i'm definitely going to seek out more press passes and stuff like this and, and things like this and definitely next year for Indie Film Fest and Heartland I would like to you know do more with it cool so here's to 50 screenings next year wow yeah don't I'll, hold me I'll shoot that. for like 8 <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice we'll see yeah all right. Well, thanks for listening, guys, and uh, we'll be back next week with I think we're going to do a review episode of Steve Jobs. I believe we are in the can. Cool. Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks for listening, guys. And uh, oh, you can find more information about Heartland uh, at heartlandfilm.org or heartlandfilmfestival.org. Um, really great, really great um, organization, and I believe they have like certain things uh, popping up uh, intermittently throughout the year. And mm. in I think March they'll have. Uh, some of the best, I think, at, at the Artcraft Theater in Franklin, which I talked about a few episodes ago, um, they'll be screening Best of the Fest. Uh, it's a collection of some of the best films from Heartland and nice. kind of the marathon thing. So cool. be on the lookout for that. And uh, as always, we don't have a sign off, so thanks for listening. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thanks, guys. So Jesus si- Christ. So single, tiny. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god I'm almost there <laughs> Okay <laughs> I'm gonna put this as a tag For context I just got my notes out And I, I filled up a notebook I literally like I, fill, I have a, a reporter's notebook I, I filled it up and then started from the back and filled up the not didn't fill up the the I filled up about half of it on on the other side of the pages. Wow! Uh, all throughout Heartland. <laughs> Add obsessive viewer. I'm single. People. <laughs> uh, okay. Um. Thank you for listening to the Obsessive Viewer, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. You can find more of our episodes at ovpodcast.com. And you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or your preferred podcast app. The Obsessive Viewer's theme song is An Eclipse of Events and is provided by Loudlike from their EP, Mistakes We Must Make. 
You can find that and more great music from them on iTunes and like their Facebook page at facebook.com slash loudlikemusic. Any and all feedback on the podcast is encouraged. You can email the hosts individually at Matt, Tiny, or Mike at obsessiveviewer.com or send an email to the podcast in general at podcast at obsessiveviewer.com. Check out the Obsessive Viewer blog at obsessiveviewer.com where we post movie and TV reviews and the occasional editorial about the business of entertainment. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Obsessive Viewer and follow us on Twitter at Obsessive Viewer, at Obsessive Tiny, and at I am Mike White. If you want more obsessive content in your life, check out our sister site, obsessivebooknerd.com, for book reviews, author spotlights, and a general celebration of reading. Finally, if you're philosophically curious, check out Tiny's side project podcast, The Secular Perspective, which explores the concepts of faith, religion, and existence from the perspective of secular hosts. You can find that at thesecularperspective.com and subscribe to the podcast on the podcatcher of your choice. Again, thank you so much for listening. We love you. Be excellent to each other.